have the host in IIS demo solution open, and it's our customer service library service, the web host application that hosts it, and the Windows client that calls it. So let's just run this and review what it does, and then we'll go back in and see how it all works. So when I run the application, the ASP.NET development server starts up. This is hosting the service. And when I click list customers, the client is going to make a call to the WCF service and run the list customers method, which retrieves a list of customers from the Northwind database and returns it to the client. And the client then displays those in a grid. If I select a customer and click get details, the client sends a message to the service to run the get details method passes the customer ID and what comes back is the company name, the contact name, and the contact title. If I make a change to any of the information and click Save Changes, the client calls the service, passes the company name, contact name, and contact title, and asks it to run the Save Changes method. And if the changes were successfully saved, that method returns a true, and the form displays that the information was saved. Okay, let's shut this down and go explore the solution. First thing we'll look at is the service itself. It's in the Project Customer Service Library. And if I open up iCustomer Service, this defines the interface. That interface is attributed as a service contract. And there are three methods in here that are exposed. List customers, get customer details, save changes. And those all have operation contract as their attribute. When a client calls list customers, the service will send back a list of customers as a generic list of the customer class. So here's the definition for the customer class and its attributed data contract. So the serializer knows how to take an instance of the customer class and convert it to XML. The get customer details method returns an instance of the customer detail class. And that's also attributed as a data contract because that needs to be serialized. The customer service file is the code that actually runs when a client calls the service. So when the list customers method runs, the service sends a select statement off to the Northwind database, and SQL Server sends back customer ID and company name, and that gets sent back to the client, a list of customers. Customer details takes customer ID as an argument and then retrieves the company name, contact name, and contact title for that customer. And what gets returned is an instance of the customer detail class. And then save changes sends an update statement and returns true if the number of rows changed was not zero. The service is hosted in the web host project. And this web host project is a website. This customer service.svc file, let's look at that. This tells the service host where to find the service. And the service is customer service library.customer service. So there's a reference in this web host class to the customer service library. And then if we look at the web.config file, if we go down to the system.service model section. We're defining the name of the service, and we define an endpoint. This endpoint has an address, a binding, and a contract. The binding is WSHTTP binding. That's the default binding Visual Studio uses when you create a WCF project. Here's the contract, customer service library.i customer service. Because our address literally is going to be customer service.svc, the address is actually blank. We're using a relative address. And the default basically is localhost. Now, for the client and the service to communicate, the endpoints have to match. So, the easiest way in the client to match up the endpoints is to create a service reference. So, you can add a service reference, enter the URL, which is customer service.svc, click go. And 
That's well, actually not exactly the right one. The ASP.NET development server uses a different port. So if I enter 2985, there we go. So this list here are things we called in the past. In a previous demo, I called the ASP.NET development server on that port. And in this demo, it's currently using this port. It's just a little thing you need to watch out for when you use the development server. But here's our service, and there are the operations. So when I created this, I called that customer service, and here's our reference to the service. Now if we expand this, and we expand this reference.svc map, and we look in the reference file, here's the class, customer detail. There's a customer class in there and if we scroll down to customer service client this is what I was looking for this is the proxy class that knows how to talk to the service and it has methods for each of the methods of the service so this is the code Visual Studio creates when I add a service reference to enable the client to talk to the service and then if we look in forms code. When we start up, we create a new instance of that proxy class, customer service client, and pass the name of the endpoint. It's the name of the endpoint in the client's app.config file, which Visual Studio created when I added the service reference. So if we come down here, here's that name, and that defines this address. which is the SVC file, webhost, customerservice.svc. Here's the binding, wshttp, and the contract. So we go back to the form. We create a new instance of the proxy class, passing that name. And now this proxy variable can talk to the service. And proxy has a list customers method. It has a get customer details method. And it has a save changes method. And so that's how this form communicates with the service. When the user clicks list customers, the client calls the list customers method of the service. And what comes back is an array of customers. And that gets bound to the grid on the form. When the user clicks get details, the form calls the get customer details method, passes the customer ID of the customer that was selected in the grid. And what comes back is an instance of the customer detail class. And then finally, when the user clicks save changes, the client calls the save changes method of the proxy class, which calls the save changes method of the service. It returns true if the information was saved and false if the information wasn't saved. So in a lot of ways, this is the easiest way to host a WCF service using IIS. You create a web host project. And so what I did to create this was I added a new website. I selected WCF service. Choose either file system to use the ASP.NET development server, which is great for development because then you can run this on your own computer. Or if you're using IIS, select HTTP. Then just create a reference to the actual service update the SVC file so the service host knows how to call the service. When you run the application, the ASP.NET development server starts up and it automatically starts the service, creates the endpoints, and is listening for clients to call it. You don't have to do any of that work yourself. In the client, you create a service reference, so now the client is wired up to the service. Then to call a method of the service, you just call a method of the proxy class. Very straightforward, very simple.